Hello, Bhagirat. Hari Om, Brother Shankara. Hari Om. Hari Om. Hari Om, Brother Shankara. Ah, Sham, so good to see you. Yeah, good to see you. Namaste. Namaste, namaste. And Bhagirat, are you there? I can't see you. Video. Yeah, we need to, you need to start your video. Mustai Kitty Group, Sunanda Tilunil Kitty Group, another. अच्छा तो दिक्कत ना तो अपडेट करता कर लिया चल जाता इसमें फोन आता हम्म ठीक है कौन कौन है बस इंडिया है there he is hello there Bhagirat माँ पारी से and where did he go there he is so we need to have you a little bit louder Cindy, this says I've been signed out because I'm signed in from another device. But it doesn't seem to be the case. I seem to be there. Yeah, you're, you're still there. Um, I signed in. Wait a second. I, I, I signed in as you so that I can have the co-host. Um, OK, good. Yeah. Okay, so we're we're all here. I can, yeah, I can see. It, it, I can won't, see. it won't sign you out. I can see everything here too. Yeah, I can see you. Bhagirat? I can't hear your word you're saying. Let's try again. Okay. There we go. Now I can hear you. All right. Very good. So uh, we're not we're we're still a few minutes away. Yes. Uh, is your is your singer uh, signed on? I I don't see her here. Uh huh. Okay. Well, let's hope she comes along soon. Uh, one question: Will you do the opening prayer, the Om Saha Navavatu? I can do that. Yes. Yeah. Would you please, and the closing yes. prayer also? Yes. Okay. Good. If she joins later, we can do that song at the end rather than in the beginning. But we don't have to hold up everything for everybody. All right. Namaste, Brother Shankara. Hello, Haima. Hello. Namaste, dear. Namaste. Namaste. Namaste, Brother Shankara. Namaste. Namaste. Namaste to you all. This is Neera. Hello, Neera. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Hey, there she Hi. is. There can she is. You, can you see me? No. Yes, Agarath, we're so glad you're doing that, doing this uh, this morning. Is uh, this is, will be a great blessing to all of us? He did not hear. I did. Oh, you did. Uma. I'm so humble. <laughs> not to respond. 
All right, it is now 11 o'clock officially. Okay. Uh, welcome everyone to our Sunday morning talk. Uh, our guest speaker is Dr. Bhagirat Majmadar, who will uh, tell us what he's going to speak about, and he will take it from here. Bhagirat, again, thank you so very much for your effort and your uh, willingness to do this for us. Om Hari Om Tat Sat. Hari Om Tat Sat. For today's initial prayer, I pulled up an old prayer which Swami Yogeshwaranji was done, doing many, many, many years ago. Can everyone hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, then I start with that prayer. And Brother Shankar, you will like it because Swami Yogeshwaranji specially made this prayer for us many, many years ago. Oh Lord, lead us from the unreal to the real. Lead us from darkness to light and lead us from death to immortality. May all be free from dangers. May all realize what is good. May all be actuated by noble thoughts. May all rejoice everywhere. May all be happy. May all be free from disease. May all realize what is good. May none be subject to misery. May the wicked become virtuous. May the virtuous attain tranquility. May the tranquil be free from bonds. May the freed make others free. May good betide all people. May the sovereign righteously rule the earth. May all beings ever attain what is good. May the worlds be prosperous and happy. May the clouds pour rain in time. May the earth be blessed with crops. May all countries be freed from calamity. May holy man live without fear. May the Lord, the destroyer of sins, the presiding deity of all sacred works be satisfied. For he being pleased, the whole universe becomes pleased. He being satisfied, the whole universe feels satisfied. Om Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. We'll start with a Prayer and music by Neera first. Neera, can you take over? No. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> ये मालिक तेरे बंदे हम ऐसे हो हमारे कर्म नेकी पर चले और बदी से डरे ताकि हंसते हुए निकले दम ए मालिक तेरे बंदे हम ऐसे हो हमारे कर्म नेकी पर चले और बदी से डरे ताके हंसते हुए निकले दम ऐ मालिक तेरे बंदे हम बड़ा कमजोर है आदमी अभी लाखों है उसमें कमी बड़ा कमजोर है आदमी अभी लाखों है उसमें कमी पर तू जो खड़ा है दयालु बड़ा तेरी कृपा से धरती थमी 
दिया तूने हमें जब जन्म तो ही मेटे का हम सब के गम नेकी पर चले और बदी से डरे ताके हंसते हुए निकले दम ए मालिक तेरे बंदे हम है अंधेरा घना छा रहा तेरा इंसान घबरा रहा है अंधेरा घना छा रहा तेरा इंसान घबरा रहा हो रहा बेखबर कुछ ना आता नजर सुख का सूरज छिपा जा रहा है तेरी रोशनी में जो दम तू अमावस को कर दे पूनम नेकी पर चले और बदी से टले ताके हंसते हुए निकले दम ए मालिक तेरे बंदे हम जब जुल्मों का हो सामना तब तू ही हमें थामना जब जुल्मों का हो सामना तब तू ही हमें थामना वो बुराई करे हम भलाई करे नहीं बदले की हो भावना बड़ उठे प्यार का हर कदम और मिटे वैर का ये भरम नेकी पर चले और बदी से टले ताके हंसते हुए निकले दम ए मालिक तेरे बंदे हम ऐसे हो हमारे करम नेकी पर चले और बदी से डरे ताके हंसते हुए निकले दम ए मालिक तेरे बंदे हम This is an earnest prayer at a time of dire need which the human beings run into. Cindy, can you give me back my image? We can see you. You see? Okay. Yes. Fine. it would be tempting to translate every word which is very meaningful in this prayer but when you are in distress you always go to the lord and that is malik the second beauty of this song is that it mixes up very intricately and articulately the urdu poetry and also sanskrit poetry they are intertwined which is very appropriate for the juncture of the orthodox jewish easter day today we are all one like our president past president said let us all hang in together or else each one of us will hang separately this is the critical moment which we are facing deep inside we are very mournful we are very grief stricken there is something which is very oppressive to our soul 
that we have experienced. And therefore, we need to address this. I'm trying to connect it to the TV, but... Am I? Am I not? That's what I was thinking. I'm not connected. You're, you're fine, Dr. Mudge. That was somebody coming in. Okay, fine. Sorry. So let me start by a quotation from the classic written by Charles Dickens, A Tale of Two Cities. It came to my mind an amazing, somebody wrote it from Washington DC at the same time. That means we are along the same track of thinking. We all are. And a Vedantic study like this will connect us further, more intricately, more inseparably. So in the tale of two cities, which is basically during the conflict between England and France, Charles Dickens writes, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. It was the age of wisdom, it was the age of foolishness. It was an epoch of belief, it was an epoch of incredulity. It was a season of light, it was a season of darkness. These are the two states of mind. Although he puts as two states of two cities, but right now we are experiencing. And that is what I want to gradually bring up with our traditional Vedantic wisdom, that it is not all dark. There is dark, but it's not all dark. Yes, we have lost thousands of lives. There is no question about that one. That grief will not be forgotten for a long time to come. But at the same time, other thousands of people have rushed to help us, to help the dying people. They have taken a risk of putting their own life at stake to help them. They have come from every walk of life. They are always giving the first credit to physicians, which I understand, but I expand because this tragedy and this wonderful spirit of fighting against it has been offered by physicians, nurses, health workers, the hospital cleaners, the hospicists, the farmers, the truck drivers, the nurses aides, the home care. It goes to show how interconnected we are. And to recognize our interconnection is the very first step towards the wisdom. It gives us a reassurance that yes, in times of grief, we will not be left alone. Someone will help us because that is the way God has made us. But at the same time, we want to live long and still we want to be healthy all the time. We want to live long, but we don't want to be old. We want to live long, but never have any disease processes. We want to enjoy life, but we don't want any suffering. So this list of contradictory demands, if we put before God, who is our father, he would say, these are my spoiled children. We have to stop acting like spoiled children. Show our gratitude for what we have in addition to being aware of what we do not have. But this particular tragedy, if we come to think of that one, was very targeted. It was like a telescopic gun, only killing the human beings. The animals were spared. They could carry the germs, but they would not suffer from it. 
So particularly, it affected the human beings. And we died in thousands of them. Not only here, but everywhere in the world. When an occasional death comes place, we call it sporadic. When within a community deaths happen, we call it endemic. When a large community is affected, we call it epidemic. When the whole globe is involved, involved we call it pandemic. So we are in a state of pandemic. In a state of pandemic, to raise figures as to who started it is not only unnecessary, it is very counterproductive. I was approached by the American Asian group of medical students from Emory saying that they are feeling the harassment because it started in Wuhan, China. There is a story of a hospice who when he was going to do his self-sacrificing self work to help the patients in the train, they looked at him and say, oh, you are the cause of this epidemic. This is nothing but a stark ignorance. This ignorance, we have got to take out of, us, of ourselves. Whatever helps you, Vedant, Christianity, Muslim, Islam, Jewish, but all these religions should combine to give us a collective wisdom that this is the suffering of humanity, which has nothing to do with caste, color, creed, gender, age, anything like that. Step by step, we understood that one. And there are, if you read the last issue of the Time Machine magazine, there are very pathetic examples. They are pathetic because when you read their work, you find out that they are more unfortunate than the people who died at their hands. To see them being killed every day is so unsettling. It is so traumatizing. And that is reflected in the words and experience of everyone. Like a nurse said that every morning at six o'clock when I go to the hospital, I feel like a goat which is being carried to a slaughterhouse because I don't know I may die there. And certainly I would not be able to save the lives which I want to. So one by one, dead. Dead, 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 dead. Especially for the health workers, physicians and nurses, this is a very traumatic experience. Because through the medical profession, you have been taught how to enjoy the triumph of the profession. How to make dying people come back to life but we have never been taught how to handle when every day, one by one by one, hundreds and hundreds and thousands die at your hands and you cannot do anything about it. That helplessness is a crushing helplessness. With that helplessness, I have seen how the physicians, when they are called, they take out that instrument, throw on the floor and step on it. I don't want to hear it because it is nothing more than a death call for many, many patients. But there's always a silver lining in every cloud. There are so many people who have put their own life at risk <clears throat> and through the trucks, they're taken the food. Through the trucks, 
they have transported the patients. There was one particular patient <coughs> who mentions he was an addict and therefore he was in an unconscious state, semi-conscious state like the addicts are. At that time, volunteers go and gave him some food. He did not expect that because he was a social discard. And he says, somebody brings me food here? Me, an addict? So he says, that is the calling of the Lord. So he says, now I'm going to distribute food to others. See how it awakens the best in us. There is a nurse who after 18 hours, when she went home, she had a little boy who wanted to come and hug him. And she could not do that one. So she says, sorry, I am unclean. I would give a moment. If someone of you recalls, when did we use the term unclean in this country? Many, many decades ago. That is when the leprosy patients were going as a group on the streets. They would carry and speak. We are unclean. We are unclean. We are unclean. So that we do not go near them. They would go to a priest. He would lead them to a cemetery and show Choose your plot where you want to die. That is the kind of pessimistic thing we created for the lepers at that time. And yet, when I was in South America, right at the coast was a Christian missionary whose statue had been erected. He lost his life while taking care of the leprosy patients. So see my friends, what I'm saying is, this is the God's world. And that Vedanta tells us the best. It gives us the straight wisdom that life is going to be full of joy and suffering. Life and death. Good things and bad things. Good people and bad things. Bad people. And that is why our Poet Blake, he said, There is always a marriage of the good and the evil, and God stands there as the best man because he negotiates between the good and the bad, and his job is continuously to turn the evil into good. That to me is a phenomenon. And that is the phenomenon which is always taught to us by Vedanta. And when I say Vedanta, I do not mean a Hindu religion conceived in India. No. It is conceived by a God's messenger, like Jesus Christ. He gave the message which God gave him. That is the message we have to learn to propagate so that we are as much grief stricken as the dead people as we are worried about the survivors because they are going to suffer enormously. Their wounds are going to be very difficult to heal in the foreseeable future. Many of them did not have a chance to say even goodbye to their dying relative. That's why when the governor of New York, when he said that these people who died were somebody's wife, somebody's father, somebody's grandfather, somebody's children, it touched my heart. That compassion is a divine message to all of us. If we ever disregard it, it is a very sorry state of us. Having said that, my question that comes to my mind, 
Is this the first time that people are being killed in this large number? What is our history of the planet? All the wild big beasts, like dinosaurs, one by one they killed them. Then came the ferocious animals like tigers and lions. We killed them, drove them out. Then came the snakes, we drove them out. Nowadays, the Vedantic illustration of snake versus rope, people do not even understand because they have not even seen a snake. Snakes have gone away. Then came the smaller, then man started killing man. And then the microbes came in picture. And they don't come in the picture now. I remember exactly how the dean of our medical school, he came from uh, National Institute of Health. So he was, he was a microbiologist. He says our future is going to be not the wild big animals, but the animal cues, the microbes. Because microbes came first on this earth, we came much later on. So this earth belongs to them. And secondly, the way to which, the extent to which they can multiply, nobody else can multiply. And therefore, they would always have a superiority of numbers over us. So this is where, to me, the Vedantic wisdom comes. What we are saying is, we'll kill the roaches, we'll kill the mosquitoes, we'll kill the microbes, but that killing, we would not even think as offensive or bad. As we wash our hands, which we have to do, there are hundreds of these coronaviruses that we are killing them. We don't think of that one that way. Because in the back of our mind, we feel that we human beings are the only ones for whom this planet has been created. There is no room for anybody else. Which is a fallacy. That does not mean that you, you have to, you have not to protect yourself against those who are threatening your life. No, that is the very cycle. It's a cycle of life, cycle of food. This one is this one, this one is this one, and ultimately gets eaten. To understand this food cycle, to me, is the Vedantic wisdom. And yet, we are so much afraid of death. That is something I'll discuss later on. But apart from that one, is this the first time that such an epidemic comes? Oh no. Every 20 years an epidemic comes. That's why we have got Spanish flu, Asian flu, Spanish flu, Hong Kong flu, swine flu, what about the HIV AIDS patient, Ebola? They keep on coming. So that is the cycle of life. In that cycle of life, we survive, but we also thrive. And thrive means not that we create better technology. Thrive does not mean we make better buildings, better cars better living conditions. Tha means we recognize that we are one small part of this universe. And everyone has a right to live on this earth and so do we. So live and let live. Have no greed. And the greed is the one which is our biggest enemy. And that is something I think Brother Shankar very nicely discussed last time on the occasion of the Easter. See, 
the way I was thinking that thousands of years ago, with Rugveda, they identified the five elements which make the universe, which is called Panchatattva, five elements. Four elements were detected by the Greeks already. And the fourth one, the ether, was the contribution of Aristotle. So they have been almost parallel to our thinking. But we added the fifth one, not we added, we defined the five ones. And those five ones are earth, sky, water, wind, and fire. We have humiliated each one of these five elements. We have polluted our waters so that they do not promote the life of the aquatic animals. We have mistreated fire as propagated by Pine, Professor Pine, P-Y-N-E. He was originally from Stanford but now is teaching in Arizona, I think. But anyway, he has written five books on fire. He says, man has most abused the fire. fire. And now we are talking about the fire killing us. So all these five elements, earth, oh earth, we have abused earth a lot more than any other elements. And this earth was called Mother Earth. We just yesterday, we select, we celebrated our Earth Day, which because of this coronavirus was not properly recognized. But we started only 50 years ago. In India, every morning you get up, get out of bed, put your foot on the earth. We beg pardon, oh Mother Earth, I beg your pardon, I touch you with my feet, but it's not an offense. Which mother has not been touched by the feet of the children, tell me. It is a part of the mother-child relationship. The child kicks with the feet and mother smilingly absorbs it. And therefore, Mother Earth has done that one. But there is a point up to which. That is why we celebrate Kali. We call her Mother. Because Mother is wonderful as long as, as a child, you are reasonable. Beyond that, she can also be furious. That's why we call her Durga. Chandi. These are the fierce forms because when the insult and the humiliation to the mother exceeds its normal mark, then we have gone out of it. We pay the price for it. And you see the earthquakes everywhere, fire everywhere. We see the tornadoes blowing from everywhere. Can you imagine that this time, when they were trying to recover, when the community was trying to recover from coronavirus, it was so difficult, there was a tornado on the top of it, insert to the injury. So when all these things happen, do not try to master them. Don't think too high of yourself as human being. Remember, see in India, I think they sometimes put it beautifully that when you try to show your finger at somebody, one finger points at one person, but three fingers are touching at you, pointing you. It's about time we recognize and turn to us. Have we done something? <clears throat> yes. One thing enormously we have done is to shift the dynamic balance 
of this planet. Claude Bernard, a great physician, introduced the term milieu, M-I-L-I-E-U. That term, as a medical student, I just read it because I had to pass my examination. But now I understand what he was saying. He says there's such a delicate balance within the body that that balance should not be disturbed if you want to preserve health. That balance called milieu or homeostasis is not applicable only to the human body. Human body is a replica of the universe at large. That is why in Sanskrit they say yatha pinde tatha brahmande. As is the body, so is the universe. The Greeks say the same thing, as within, so without. These are the things which we have to reconcile. We have to understand and have a little separate, different angle of looking at things by violating the principles of law, the laws of nature, you think you will get by for a while, but nature is always going to be more powerful than us. And instead of being afraid, let us salute. Let us get her blessings. That's what was seen in the prayer with Swami Yogeshwaranjaya, that he being pleased, the whole earth is pleased. When he is displeased, there is no way we can be happy. And this time, the virus told us the best. Small little animal Q virus, which you cannot even see through the microscope. That virus shows, showed us very transparently how incapable we are. It run a havoc, we could not do anything about it. What is called Vaman is also called Virat. The smallest can sometimes be much mightier than the largest. And that is the message this time we have to learn. We have to start being good to Mother Nature. We have to start being good to each other because we are connected. And that is the brilliance of the humanity which God has instilled in us. The truck drivers, the food trucks, they do not, did not ask anyone what nationality you are. Are you black? Are you white? No. You come there. Here is your basket. Here is your basket. Here is your basket. Oh boy, if this is not God, then who is God? Are we knocking on something different which is not really God? That is why this virus has given us a few points to think about. And if you don't think now, then post virus, post pandemic complications, we will not be able to handle. See, whenever something untoward develops during the disease, it is called complication. When something develops after the disease, that is called sequela. The complications we are seeing. Let us also think about the sequela. Because if not, we rebuild our human community 
who else is going to come? God never comes directly. He inspires you to act correctly. That is why Krishna had a Sudarshan Chakra. And with that thing on his, he could destroy anyone. But he had to ask Arjun and Pandavas to have <clears throat> a war in which they win the war. He did not release his Sudarshan Chakra, which was capable of killing anyone at will of Sri Krishna. And that is why it is called Sudarshan Chakra. Sudarshan, good vision, discreet judgment. It cannot be employed. You have to fight and win your own battle. Something I very much admire in my American friends. Right from early on, they train their children to be self-dependent. I think it is a wonderful thing. That is what God intends us to do. So what are going to be our sequela? Sequela are sometimes good and sometimes bad. The good, for example, happened to the pets this time. We staying at home, if anyone on this planet is extremely happy, those are the dogs because the children are always at home playing with them. They are taken out for a walk on a regular basis, which I see on the street here. The dogs are dancing and I understand now why the Englishman said long time ago, every dog has his day. His day came today. But then what about others? Beware of one very unfortunate sequela which is developing and which is in sight if you have the right kind of vision. People are going to be depressed. People are going to be negative. People are going to be suicidal. People are going to be hobicidal. This is the psychosis. This psychosis is inevitable when a disaster strikes us. And it is pending for us. We have to be good to each other. We have to learn to be tolerant to each other. So that we can build up the whole science, the whole planet, once for all, a better world, a more cognizant world, wiser world, in which case the corona has done something good to us. We also learned, do not neglect your pre-monitor system, symptoms. See, when, when the tsunami came, in tsunami, there was a large destruction of human beings, but the animals did not die because they smelled it. Much before the tornado comes, tsunami comes, the animals had a feeling that something terrible is going to happen. So they ran away. Perhaps they are more intelligent than us. Believe me, this kind of premonitory symptoms we have had too, but we are too intelligent to think about it. People were being killed. The children in the schools were being killed. The human beings in large groups in a concert killed Las Vegas. That means the evil is trying to get into us. Slow down. Look back. Change your way of thinking. That is where the opportunity is gone, is opportunity missed. 
we have had to take that opportunity. About this virtual meeting that we are having, I'm so happy that we are trying to sidetrack the complications of COVID-19, COVID-19. But on the other hand, we are gradually, gradually staying away from human touch, which is not a good thing. Because to touch is a very important part of us. That's the way we give our warmth, our compassion. And as such, because of the technology, we are having a social distancing anyway. The social distances is not only six feet apart that we are being taught right now. Yes, it is good for the coronavirus, but that social distancing can greatly destroy our mutual support, mutual love, mutual compassion. And therefore, once again, not a tug of war, but a hug of war. We hug each other. We make everyone feel wanted, loved, necessary. And when that happens, automatically, the interaction between the human beings change. We have to expand our family. Those of you who have taken courses in biology, each plant, each animal has been given a family. And this is of this family. This plant is of this family. But that plant has to stay only in this family. It cannot expand the family anymore. A dog cannot expand the family to be a cat. No, they are chiseled out to be dogs, chiseled out to be cats. We are the only ones who can expand our family. And that expansion I have delightfully seen in some of the American women who have adopted and raised their adopted children like I have never seen before. I wish sometimes I can share those stories with you. But that has taught me that sometimes parenthood is not by birth alone, but parenthood is by attitude. These are the children who could have gone berserk but they have been rescued in time, loved, and there you are. You see the results. Then as the time comes near, finally, we have to learn how to overcome the fear of death. Because that is something which this Corona attack has forced us to recognize. Within minutes, you can die. No previous warnings. And that death can be so rapid in such a large number that the inherent fear of death that we have is further fortified by this event. See, if you are given a choice, for example, if you are taking a test, and I say, English plague, AIDS, Spanish flu, Ebola, which one you will like to have out of these four or five, then you will start looking for the fifth choice of none of the above because we are afraid. And this is about the time. This is a very good topic for our Vedantists to discuss sometime. But right now, I would only, only mention the book written by Bernard Shaw. See, after writing 
Anna Karenina, for seven to eight years, he did not write any book. Then finally he wrote a book where a chapter called Death of Ilan, Illinois, whatever way it is spoken. And that chapter is phenomenal. It's a Vedantic chapter. Because ultimately this man who through multiple steps became a judge in a big court, step by step by step by step. He thought, oh, what a wonderful achievement I have in my life. I have everything. I got the status, everything. And then suddenly he's having a pain. And from the pain, the doctor says that you're likely to die. And then he turns for the first time to the topic of death, which he thought will never visit him. And then the question, which he gets, which I think we also have to ask ourselves, did I live my life right? It's not an ordinary question. It can shake you up. Did I live my life right? What were the people who died? What were they thought? They were not allowed to express anything. To me, the hospital care was very good, but few died in large number of them. But there was nothing there to tell them, we love you. We'll take care of you. Why they are being pushed into that ventilator if there's a little sign saying, don't worry, we are for you. We love you and we like to keep you alive. To me, that death could have been a notch happier. So therefore, now that question for us, with this kind of uncertainty of life that we have seen all around, we have to ask a question. Did I live my life right? Is there anything I can do to live a life which is right? If you fail, then perhaps this corona has not taught us too much. Right now we are saying that let this go and we'll do this, 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 this. But it's like a Chinese story. They say when the patient is really, really sick and the doctor takes care of him, he says, I would give you a goat if I'm cured. When he's cured, he would say, ah, goat I cannot give, I would give him a chicken. And then finally, he says, sorry, I can give you one egg. So gradually, 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 we forget the promises that we have given. We have forget the obligations that we have. And we die all of a sudden with unfinished, not even half finished, unfinished job done. And that is the lesson, at least to me, is of paramount importance. Let us take another look at our life. Live differently. And each one of us can contribute to a better human life and human interconnection. And not only human, that is why in Sanskrit they say, Sarve Bhavantu Sukhinaha. All lives. And that way we create a planet which God is proud of looking at and saying, all right, my children have done a good job. I think our time is up now, so that there is some time. Let me stop at this particular point and I'll be very happy to get your comments, questions, suggestions, your thoughts, your fears. So that's what it is all about. Thank you.
Thank you so very much for this very comprehensive and inspiring talk. One of the things that it brought to mind was something that Swami Prabhupada would say uh, when he was asked, was prayer effective? And he would say, what? Do you think you're separate? Of course, prayer is effective. Uh, pray, pray for others, make japam for others. And so uh, it really, uh, in, in line with what you were said, in line with what you were saying about changing our lives, uh, one of the things that we can do is be uh, more proactive in our reaching out, even though we're physically separated. We are not, of course, uh, according to what Swami Prabhupada and all the teachers tell us, we are not separated uh, spiritually. So the, the, the love and the prayers and the mm, desire for uh, support and love that we offer to others, uh, Swami Prabhupada triple underlined, yes, it has an effect. Brother Shankar, I would say first we have to qualify ourselves to be able to pray. Prayer is not for everyone. Half-hearted, unmanned prayers are never giving us the promise of fertility. And that is something which Shakespeare, in his poetic way, did long time ago. He says, he says, my, yes, my words fly above, my thoughts remain below. Prayers, words without action, seldom to heaven's go. Thank you, Bhagavan. May I make a comment? Yes, please. Um, what I think is right now, I mean, I agree totally with Dr. Majumdar. He really did a great presentation and all his points are so true. And the one other thing I was thinking is the world right now is going through a change. Um, and that, you know, is not always something that's comfortable. We will all suffer, but we have to stand up to it because only change can bring about a better world. And what we believe, paradise or satyug, that will come after this great upheaval is over. So we have to all go through this change or parivartan to get into a better place. And the way to do it is to realize our mistakes that we've made with the five elements, with each other, and to live with better values and in harmony with nature like the native Indians did in, you know, in America. Thank you. Absolutely. But during that time, I would say, observe objectively, suffer selectively. Objectively observe means, if you are shaken up by things that you see, but then do not know how to selectively suffer and help someone who is suffering, in that case, the message is lost. And we are very good in sight-tracking the right message. Nira, did you have something? She'll have to probably unmute herself. I don't see her name. There. Hello, this Hi. is Vijay. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes, please Vijay. go right ahead. A quick question, Dr. Maj. You said very beautifully that not only the big, even the small has its place. In other words, it's not only a big army that we can be proud of, as in this country, but we have to have 
the humility to recognize even the small, the nations who may not be as privileged as we are and not feel the ego, oh, I am the best, I have the biggest, I can do what I want. And I believe that also is a message from your very fine lecture today. I'm trying to get this quote from Shakespeare to recognize that long time ago. Listen, he says, but man, proud man, dressed in a little brief authority, most ignorant of what he's most assured, his glassy essence like an angry ape plays such fantastic tricks before high heaven as makes the angels weep. Mm. Thank well, you. Aren't we, seeing that, aren't we seeing that right now just being played out? Isn't that something? Yes. The angels must be weeping indeed. I have a comment, Dr. Mudd. It's Jyoti over here with Shankara. Um, I really appreciated you bringing out the part of the value of sharing our warmth through touch. And that when this is over, um, it, this has been a great forum to be able to see each other on the computer. But when this is over, hopefully um, our coming together again will mean that much more and it'll touch our hearts that much more deeply. As my teacher used to say, um, hug asana is the highest of the yoga poses. Ah, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Absolutely. <clears throat> and that touch doesn't come from our body. It is right. connected to the higher source. Exactly. I'm just reminded of a little story when this girl, five years old, her classmate died. And she asked her mom that I want to see his mom because she is full of grief. So she says, yes. After a while, she came back. She says, how do you feel? Very good. What did you say? Oh, no, I didn't say anything. I just sat in her lap and wept. And she wept in turn. Mm -hmm. We both felt so good. That is human touch. Mm -hmm. Sweet story. Mm -hmm. I wanted to. I wanted to add to that as well. That um, I'm so thankful that we're all able to connect through technology. That we that we're in a time where we have these ways to actually see each other and connect with each other and. I meet with my students every day. And at first I, I didn't val see how, the va how much value that had. But um, as time is going on, children are having a very difficult time. You know, as adults, we can understand this will come to an end. You know, this isn't forever, but children are really struggling with not being able to play with their playmates, being at home alone with their parents. And I've had some of my students just break down in tears you know, during our daily meetings. And so, you know, they're so important for them, for us to just see each other that we, we still exist, you know? <laughs> they're, they're, our friends are still out there and they can still hear us and we can still talk with them. And that's so important. And it goes along with all that, the issues that you're talking about of depression and, you know, potential suicides and, and things like that too. It touches all of us. That is happening even to the children. They are yeah. suicidal now. Because they are, so I don't know whether you saw that or not, but one time their teacher, she drove through the street and the students were all on the side of the streets waving to the teacher. And you should see the smile on their face when they saw the teacher as if they have rejuvenated. But the technology, once again, we have to handle it properly once this crisis is over. Because like 
many philosophers say technology is wonderful as a servant but pretty bad master yes. mm. so if we allow that to be our master then sorry our our life is going to be very complicated um uh, can i say something please um so basically i i've been reading about karma yoga a little bit and i think uh, we need to identify that we are our own masters basically uh, and we do not need anything else but believing in in ourselves and looking within us will actually liberate us from any kind of negative thoughts or depressive mood anything are you been reading swami vivekananda Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. That's what I thought. It sounded like what Swamiji said. All right. Yes, exactly. I'm reading. Reading. I'm going through his complete works, and uh, and uh, I'm kind of alone all the time, doing working in my data stuff, and without my child, and I'm alone. So I do feel depressed at times, but I I go back to those phenomenal texts and. If we just do your thoughts. if we choose our thoughts properly proper karma will automatically follow them and secondly once again don't lose too much time you might be young you are so energetic looking but that doesn't guarantee an endless flow of life that's why i read this this was very good bad news the time is flying the good news you are the pilot <laughs> <laughs> nicely said well just to underline for those of you who haven't read what the, that fellow was uh, talking about uh, swami vivekananda said it used to be said that a person who did not believe in god was an atheist i tell you that now the person who does not believe in him or herself is an atheist we need to reach that sense that was being spoken of by that fellow of the uh, the truth of ourselves and how much guidance real guidance is available uh, swami yogeshananda's teacher once remarked that most of us never gain access to the buddhi to that uh, great determinative and discriminative power within us that will guide us because we don't make the effort at uh, uh setting aside the distractions that allow us to hear, hear what is by the poet called that still small voice in that conjunction brother shankar you're bringing a variety of different things every sunday we so much appreciate you are holding the candle so that the candle illuminates but does not burn and you are coming from different sources you do not take one source there is upanishad there is gita there is mythology there is jewish religion there are some very unknown authors that you bring and that to me brings us a multifaceted development of our knowledge and wisdom and we appreciate it so much so much well thank you bhagirat each of us is a unique jewel each of us is a unique facet of that illimitable jewel that is the divine presence yes and so there is is as vivekananda pointed out we have only begun to learn there is so much more to learn because we are uh, we are immersed in and part of the infinite there is no end to it light more light brahmananda light more light is there no end to it just to a small example if ramakrishna did not see vivekananda or vivekananda did not see ramakrishna what a loss it would have been to the world ah, yes well you know takur said he invited him <laughs> <laughs> i believe that i believe that can we say that too was the creation of the god almighty oh yes oh yes 
he meant it to happen that way, I guess. I don't know. Not just meant it, so ardently desired it. How great was thy sacrifice, freely choosing thy birth in this prison, our iron age, to unchain us and set us free. Hmm. How great was thy mercy, all thine austerities were practiced for our sake. The, 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 Sri Ramakrishna's life, the parable of the prodigal child, they give us some glimpse of how deeply the divine loves its children and how, uh, how, how what great lengths the divine will go through, go to, to save us from ourselves and ennoble us. And that's what Bhagirat was talking about this morning. It was so beautiful. Let us ennoble ourselves as a result of this. Let us be our best selves. And as we do that, we radiate out into the world something that is world transforming. But parenthetically, if we do not use the faculty which God has invested in us, it is such a loss. And once again, that question is going to bother us very deeply at the last moment. Did I live my life right? And live my life right means everything that God had given me, I have given back or not is a question. My, my Angelo put it that God has given us two hands. One hand to receive, one hand to heal. So continuously keep on using these two hands. Mm -hmm. And that's why we have created so many hands in God's image. Uh -huh, yes. Because he gives with so many hands. Well, as you pointed out, uh, Dr. Mudge, the, the, this, this, these last moments, Krishna speaks to it so eloquently in the Gita. Get, get yourself ready. Uh, and then uh, Adi Shankaracharya also speaks to it. At the end, are we, only, are we going to say, oh, I just let this slip away. I just committed, and these are uh, Shankaracharya's words, I just committed slow suicide. May so, I say something, please? Please. Yes, yes, yes. Um, you know, since we are talking about death and life, we have several examples in history of how people have faced death. For example, Socrates, when he was given the glass of poison to drink, what did he say? Or St. Paul, when he was being stoned, or all the apostles, and Christ, of course. So Paul, for example, said, to me, to live is Christ, but to die is gain. All of them had a perspective of life that was quite different from what I have had or what you see surrounding you. For them, it's a continuum, not that we are born and then die, but it's a continuum. And so if you, we can connect with that energy within us that Gaurav was talking about and understand that to do a japam or to have a prom receive a promise from Thakur that he is with you, whether you are here or there, then we are able to face much better uh, our daily uh, struggles with self-transformation because to live is to be in service of others and to die is to gain anyway. It's very good to be able to see it that way indeed. Yes. Dr. Majumdar, this is Haima. Yes, yes, Haima. Thank you so much, as usual, for sharing your spiritual and professional wisdom with us. It was amazing. It was really, really, I was speechless when I was listening to you. I, when the first, when they announced COVID and the shelter in place, I thought, God has come through this whole coronavirus to set the universe straight. Exactly, that's what it's doing. 
I think adversities, through adversities, even Mother Teresa said that, through suffering, you get closer to God. Yes. So we are getting closer to God more than ever before in our lifetime. And thank you, thank you, thank you. It was wonderful. You, you touched every point of the universe. I really appreciate your time. Incidentally, COVID is a Sanskrit word. That means experienced. Really? Yes. And we have experienced all these tragedies. That is why we thought of pralaya. Yeah. Pralaya was a preconceived idea of mass destruction. Hmm. And by the same time, Corona runs with Karuna, which is empathy. Yes, that's right. Karuna so which can... aspect you are going to select and develop is your choice. Yes, you're right. You're right, 100%. I agree with you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. This is very good. I want to say something. May I please? Please, Uma. I should just get muted. I can't unmute her because you can't. you've muted yourself, dear. Rather than unmuting yourself, you muted yourself. Uh oh. There we go. Now we can hear you. So we weren't able to hear you before. Okay. Start in again. We are all talking about seeing the silver lining behind every dark cloud. What is the silver lining right now? The way I think about it is the biggest lesson that we all are learning right now is to slow down, slow down we are filling our calendars with all kinds of wonderful as well as unnecessary distractions, activities, meetings, programs. Now believe me, <laughs> I'm not against any wonderful program or play or music. But if you look at our, honestly, look at our calendars, there's, we are, we have gone berserk with planning unnecessary things, going here and there, go, go, go all the time. So to me personally, when I now see my calendar, I breathe easily. I say, my goodness, this is the first time in my life, my adult life, I don't have to go anywhere. I can stay by myself. <laughs> I am the master of my planning, my day. How do I want to spend it? And so this to me, coronavirus for the first time kept us locked up. But the way I see it, it is not locked down. It is the road to our freedom. Mm -hmm. Freedom to be, freedom to do when and how and how much. So this should awaken with, I think, all of us to plan our event selectively and not fill up the calendar that we don't have time to do what is essential, like thinking, like reflecting, like really going deep into something that you really want to do in life. It can be talking to somebody who is suffering, giving some kind of solace, or even reviving some <coughs> hobby that we have put aside for a long time. How many of us really like to send a letter? We are so used to texting. 
that I, <laughs> during this time that I had more time, I went back to my closet and opened all the old letters that I used to write to India to, to send to my parents. And I read their letters. And that kind of communication, I hope that you can all revive the deeper interests in life and not shallow and unmeaningful things. That's my two cents. So can I say something, please? Please. Um, so first and foremost, I feel so blessed that today we were able to partake in uh, the, uh, for the last 30 years that I have known Majmudar family and Dr. Maj's wisdom from professional, personal, religious, spiritual, in every way that he has perspective that unparalleled. And of course, Brother Shankar, I had a joy of, uh, you know, participating in a few of your satsangs and it's been a long time. But what I felt was that it's uh, like mother nature uh, to its naughty kids that you've been naughty, go into your room and think what you've done. And this is our time to just be in that room and introspect and see what we've done, what wrong we've done. And this is our time to reflect on that and make it right as we open up. So I just wanted to say thank you again. <laughs> exactly, you're right. Well, thank you for that. And yes, this is a time out, isn't it? Hmm. May I say something? Please. Uh, well, the thing is, uh, another thing again from Swami Vivekananda is we need to start considering that we are privileged to be living in this world. The world really doesn't need us as much as we need the world. We are just passing through. So I think that respect for the world and loving everything that we have is paramount. I think that, that that's one of the main reasons we are stopped loving it, which is why we are having these issues, I guess. Not, not to disagree with you, dear, about uh, our just passing through and so on, but it's, it is worth noting that Hafiz wrote a, a, a conversation with God that God said, each soul completes me. Each soul completes me. So uh, we are not uh, superfluous. We may be errant right now, but we're not superfluous. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being willing to participate. One question, one question for my husband, Dr. Match. Um, you said that uh, we have abused fire. Could you please uh, expand on that? How have we abused fire? Fire. It's a very, very, very good question. Uh, number one, that when we build our houses and everything, we build it entirely from our standpoint as to what should be the view, what kind of house should be there. And according to Dr. Pine, what we should do that the fire is a natural sequence in any forest. Every forest has to have some fire episodically so that it can regenerate. So it's not a destructive phenomenon, it's a reconstructive phenomenon. Secondly, the fire when contained is wonderful, but when it gets out of the environment, out of control, that's where the problem comes. And therefore, the, the, the reason we thought that fire was a god, Agni Deva, Vayu Deva, Varun Deva, when we came with that concept, most of the Westerners thought it was paganism. These are the pagans, you are thinking of God. No, on the other hand, gradually you could see it comes from the babe's mouth. And with the fire and the Gita, came from Sudan and said, you are warming up the earth. She's gone. We did not listen to that one. 
So there are many ways, but I think that is both a technical question and also a philosophical question. So we cannot discuss that in full length, but it's a good idea to have a second look that we do all the time in medicine. When we have done the surgery, then after a while, we'll open the body again to see how did we do? Did the cancer go away? That is what we call second look operation. So we have to have a second look with, at everything that we've been doing to find out what was right and what was not. Can I, can I also say something? Uh, yes, that, um, you know, this satsanga at Vedanta, what we call satsanga is, uh, you know, the question answer, the intellectual exchange of ideas um, is unique to this organization because I have been coming there also when I used to be very regular many years ago. Um, so because I also sing at all the different temples and you know various ways people pray so it's wonderful to do that too and bhajans and everything but i just want to commend and kind of just express my gratitude that this kind of exchange of ideas the thoughts it is very stimulating and keeps you thinking like what i heard today and in last one month and a half you know many people there are whatsapp forwards and this but it's just so beneficial and I really, really want to thank you, brother, and thank you all participants who have, uh, who carry out this kind of exchange. So uh, Vedanta, it's just amazing. So thank you very much, brother. And thank you again for this kind of exchange. Well, very helpful. Thank you, dear. And the thing for us to keep firmly in mind is that this is the continuing life of Sri Ramakrishna, Holy Mother, Vivekananda, and Brahmananda. That's what's manifest here. And that's what Swami Yogeshananda created here. And uh, the momentum of his work continues. And uh, it, 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 it is just exactly that. This is exactly what Thakur Ma intends. So we're very grateful that you all are part of this and that it... Uh, continues to be a reality for us. This is Hema, may I uh, express one thought? Please. And thank you Bhagirat Bhai for giving me this chance to in this. So <laughs> we have always, uh, and I don't have that exact Sanskrit in front of me, but we were told that always stay away from anything atirat. And mm -hmm. the way my thoughts are, is maybe things went too far into a T-Rex. We did not control ourselves in any dimension that you think about either going too fast in a life, either abusing earth, either abusing uh, climate, any respect you look at it, not into what is really important in life. Every aspect, we went way beyond. So I, I call that a T-Rex. And this is mother of nature, mother God, uh, earth's way of correcting it. And when we did not do it on our own and with our own self-understanding, so I also remember Krishna's thing, yada yada hi dharmasya, and you know, grounded in a point, this is how it is getting self-corrected. Just some thought. That's how I've been thinking about. Thank you. You know, we we have uh, thinking in all kinds of spheres. We have scientists who are thinking, philosophers who are thinking, Dr. Maju brought together um, Bernard Shaw, Shakespeare, all of these wonderful ideas. I think in Vedanta, what we are encouraged to do is think about thinking itself. So what this COVID crisis has done is help us introspect about our value system. What kind of values do we have? What are our priorities? Is it to make more money? Is it to have better gadgets? How do we treat other people? And this is what I'm getting uh, as a learning lesson for myself. What were my values 
is it in, in chapter 18 of Bhagavad Gita, we are told about rajasic values, tamasic values, sattvic values, and then from the thoughts flows our action. So, uh, and in your lecture, Dr. Madge, you have said several times, and now you're in our forum as well, people have addressed that our thoughts, we need to focus on our thoughts if we are to be transformed. I think I would like to add what I said before, that this is the time, probably <laughs> it had to come in a very, um, very, very sad way, tragic way. But if it opens our eyes to focus on what you suggested, priorities, who we are, what is our basic self, where am I going? How am I living my life? And Bhagirat said that we have to think, did I live my life right? So if this period inspires us all to take a look inside ourselves and introspection, and through introspection, we can find what we should have been doing, what we are lacking in doing, and how we can improve or transform ourselves. And Brother Shankara, very appropriately last time, spoke about resurrection of Christ. To me, this is an opportunity, God-given, I would say, although in a very traumatic way. But this is the chance to redo to reinvent ourselves and focus on what is essential, what is not essential, and how to keep the balance. Because Bhagavad Gita Krishna also says, Samatvam Yoga Muchyate. Samatvam, equal mindedness. <clears throat> so it is that equal mindedness that ability to discriminate between right and wrong, not only right and wrong, but how much of what. So when we learn this very fine art of using our God-given Viveka Buddhi, so this Viveka Buddhi, hopefully, which we have been learning since years and years coming to Sunday sessions. Those who are lucky and have time, they go to Tuesdays and Wednesdays, but Vedant doors are always open for all of us. Dive deep in that beautiful poem that late our beloved John Slank, he said, dive deep into the ocean of beauty and then you will find the gem of love. So if we can heed by those words, I think we can still have new hope, new beginnings, and new opportunity to mend our life. Thank you. Thank you, Uma. I wanted to very quickly add to what Gita Ji said, that there was a time when one person could lead thousands. That's how Krishna, Rama, even Gandhiji, but that time is gone. Now what Krishna said, Sange Shakti Hi Kalau Yuge, union is strength in these tough times. We are all given different faces and different ways of thinking. If we come together collectively, then only we can have the optimal advantage of being together. One person single, whatever name you can give him, he cannot guide you all the way through. Your guidance will come from multiple sources. Thank you, Dr. Marge. Yes, yes, yes. 
So, Dr. Mudge, if you would be so kind as to offer our closing prayer. <clears throat> Usually our tradition is that I speak the first sentence and all of you can repeat that one before I go to the second one. So I start by saying, let there be peace in outer space. Let there, Let there be, be peace, peace in outer, outer space. space. Let there be peace in the sky, on the earth, and in the waters. Let, Let there, there be peace in the sky, the on the earth, and in the waters. waters. Let there be peace in the herbs, the plants, and the trees. Let, Let there be peace, peace in the herbs, the plants, and the trees. trees. And all of us together, let there be peace in herbs, the plants, and the trees. Let, let there, there be, be peace, peace in the, the herbs, herbs, the plants, and, and the, trees. the trees. May the gods be peaceful. May, May the, the gods, gods be, be peaceful. peaceful. May the whole universe be pervaded by peace. May, May the, the whole, whole universe, universe be, be pervaded by peace. Let this infinite universal peace prevail throughout my being. Let, Let this, this infinite, infinite universal peace prevail throughout my being. Om Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. Om peace to us, peace to all, to us and to all beings everywhere. Thank you, thank you, thank you all for being here thank this you. morning. And thank you, Dr. Majmadar, for, as I said, a very comprehensive and uh, elevating look at what it is that we're facing. And your compassion, as you expressed it, for those who are on the front lines, and you, you expanded that uh, uh, to a, a wide net of people who are on the front lines of this uh, uh, risking their lives for us so that we continue to be able to live. And, uh, and it, was, it was very, very, very ennobling. So thank you again. Thank you all. Thank you. Uh, with that, thank we will end the meeting. And uh, the, next, the next time we'll have an opportunity to gather together is next Tuesday evening at 8 p.m. when we'll study the life of Holy Mother. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Rajesh. It's such a privilege to have you with us. Thank you. Thank you, Bhaiya. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so thank you. Bye, all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you, Thank you. You're most welcome, dear. Keep coming every Sunday. Yes. Uh, yes. Every Sunday, Tuesday, Wednesday. <laughs> we, we know we have no traffic issues now, so this is great. Right. Exactly. Saturdays. <laughs> All right. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Nira. Thank you, brother. Pranams. Pranams.